So, hey everyone. Um, I'm Jamie Bottoms. Um, I work at a place called Molden, and we're an e-commerce API. Um, has anyone heard of Molden? Yeah, a few people. Yeah. So we started in the uh, in the northeast, um, sort of incubated here. And now, sort of in America, trying to tackle that. And, uh, yeah, it's good fun. So my role um, in Molden, I joined in January, um, to develop success, and everyone's like, what does that mean? So I'm like developer evangelist, uh, advocate, and as of last week when I see in the blog, I was now the uh, developer success engineer. So <laughs> like, what really want, kind of build cool shit, um, and get show off our APIs and stuff. So it's uh, it's really fun, it's really challenging. Um, I was a front-end developer for about five years or so, and just wanted to sort of challenge myself and try different things. So. This role certainly um, allowed me to do that. Um, so that's, that's good fun. Um, my stack recently um, is React, Redux, and uh, TypeScript uh, recently. And uh, yeah, um, style components, Node, GraphQL is um, some of the late stuff that I've been working with. And um, is anyone here using GraphQL in production or just messing around with it? Just messing around with it? Yeah, cool. Um, React, everyone used to oh, know of React and stuff, yeah? Cool, man. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about those, obviously, and uh, <coughs> I kind of settled on GraphQL. Um, obviously, today we're going to cover that, we're going to set the state of GraphQL. Um, <coughs> so kind of just going to get it to React joke, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm going to bang on about GraphQL for a bit. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so my first experience with GraphQL was about February, March last year, uh, I was invited to GraphQL Europe, and uh, you know, flights were paid for, the conference was paid for, uh, hotel was paid for, so I thought, well, why not? Uh, the guys over at GraphQL paid for that, and uh, so I was like, got nothing to lose, just check it out, see what's going on. So this is only a year ago and that this happened. Um, so yeah, moving on, gonna dive into GraphQL, see what it's about, what the benefits are, how I'm using it now, um, and then sort of as, as we come back after the break, I'm going to show you uh, a bit of a demonstration of, of GraphQL uh, against rest of things. So uh, yeah, first of all, like I hear all the time, like GraphQL is like, like is it a database or what is it like? It's really confusing. It's not a database. Like that's just not what it is. So don't get like caught up in that. Um, and I hear this all the time on Twitter. And I said like when I first started out, I was like, like what is it? And like that can be really like challenge for people to understand when they're trying to figure out a new thing um, because there's so much like hype and buzz and everyone's saying different things about it um, but like it's not a database so like you don't have to learn a new database but it is a query language so you kind of got to learn something new um, but yeah it's not a database so it works with your existing MySQLs, Postgres, Mongos, whatever you want to use uh, it works with it so um, it's pretty cool. <coughs> so yeah um, it's not REST killer either uh, I see all the time on Twitter and like YouTube and I was saying it myself like I was doing some videos on YouTube last year um, showing people how to get into GraphQL because it's really, really loving it. Um, and it was, it was benefiting me on a few front end projects. <coughs> and I kept saying to myself and kept saying to other people on the team, like, we're going to be using this like all the time because like, it's just a risk killer. And it's, it's not. You'll use REST and you'll use GraphQL uh, together. So you know, just get over it. Like, that's how it is. Um, <clears throat> so with REST, um, a lot of people kind of turn to JSON API. Um, you know, JSON API is a battle tested, battle -tested spec. Um, you know, you can include data with your requests and sort of, you know, come back in a predictable way. Um, and it will we pride ourselves on having a predictable API that people can call and we follow the JSON API spec. Um, so, it's, you know, it's, it's, this is an alternative to using GraphQL as a choice. It's, it's not really special, um, it just allows you to code and develop in a particular way. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really important that you set a format and GraphQL helps to do that. Um, but again, REST is just the same, it's just a spec, it's just a format, um, which is cool. So that's really all GraphQL is and does. Um, it's just, just different. So this quote from Monzo, and I quite like this, a colleague of mine checked this today and I totally forgot about it, but like <coughs> Monzo, like they have a predictability API and that's what we all like to use, like on the front end, especially if you're consuming these APIs. Uh, and like Molten, we've got an e-commerce e API, people are adding a cart to the product. They need to know every single time that that request goes through, that response, return to the car items or the car or whatever, like whatever we specify in the API reference is going to come back and like it's that's cool and like again GraphQL helps with this and we'll go into why and, and, and all, all of that so, so as we go through we'll, we'll understand that. Uh, yeah. <coughs> so yeah, um, GraphQL is not a React thing, um, you can use with like Vue, Ember, uh, you know even vanilla JavaScript with some of the 
uh, node modules that's out there. We've got things like uh, Urkel and GraphQL requests, which are just node modules. You can include uh, very bare bones, don't do a lot of stuff, they've got no cache and build in. Uh, some of them do now, but there's very, very bare bones, which you can just make a, a request to a Postgres request and get that. Um, yeah, so <coughs> kind of works with like any client side or server side stuff that you can think of. Um, it's really awesome with React though. Um, I kind of started with React um, when CSS and GS was like the hype, and like in the GraphQL, GraphQL world, it's kind of moved on a little bit, I'm guessing, from that to now like render props and GraphQL. Like a lot of people are adopting GraphQL because they're seeing huge benefits in the, uh, in the client. In the client, it's much easier to handle with APIs and get the data that you want. Um, so yeah, um, you can use various front-end tools to work with, with GraphQL, uh, especially with React. Uh, I really like Apollo Client, and we'll go into that a little bit, bit later as well. But uh, I think you should just like dive in and just kind of get an overview of GraphQL, what it is, for a boy a little bit more. Um, yeah, uh, so what is it? It's a specification, we've, we've kind of said that already. The JSON API, that's a spec. GraphQL, that's a spec as well. Um, you know, it's updated every so often, about six months or so. Uh, there's kind of a lot of things going on on GitHub in the repo, and people are um, proposing these changes to the spec. Um, subscriptions dropped like, I think, middle or towards the end of last year, November, October time, subscriptions came, and that allowed people to subscribe to data changes in the view. They didn't have to mess with any um, you know, uh, like WebSocket technologies, they didn't have to embed any third party tools. GraphQL just handles that with a uh, thing called subscriptions. Um, you know, we'll go into that as well and see what the fuss is there. So yeah, check out GitHub. We've got a great spec on there. Um, please ask questions as well. None of this makes sense. Um, kind of, it's kind of a weird thing if you're not used to it, you don't understand it. Um, I don't. I want to understand a certain bit of it. Uh, use it, and it's it's cool. But there's like those questions. So if you've got any, I'll try and answer them as well uh, towards the end of this. Um, but yeah, it's nothing special. It's a, it's a query language, not a magic wand or a quick fix. It takes time to implement. Um, you know, it's a, but it's just essentially a query language with some sugar. It's always. <clears throat> Toolbox. Uh, it comes with a lot of things out of the box uh, when you install it. So if you're using it in a server side or client side, you get this thing called Graphical that comes with it as well. And that allows you like make uh, queries within the browser there and then. And this kind of just ships with it out of the box. And like, it was, like that was kind of a turning point for me. I was like, well, I'm going to hook up to my database, create all these little resolvers, and I can just go to a browser and start running queries. I didn't have to like learn like something else because of the introspection part of it in uh, Graphical. I could just like begin to type, and like it was telling me like, oh, well, I want people, or I want faces, or I want names, and it allowed me to kind of just filter through the chain and see exactly, uh, like, if I wanted a relationship, I wanted a name, I could just get all that very similarly, and like that will make sense when you use this, and we'll, we'll go over it. But um, you know, that was a mind blowing moment. It's just this tool called Graphical, and that ships with it as well, um, and I hadn't seen that in a while, so that's that's cool. But it is a choice. Uh, if you prefer to use REST, like use REST. If that's if you've got a workflow and you enjoy that, um, you know that, that I still use that. Um, not saying that anyone should use GraphQL. It's a choice at the end of the day, so um, it's cool. But yeah, most importantly, GraphQL allows you to focus on the data. So if you are working with the data uh, in whatever front end stack you're using, like you can just like build all of these things, build all of your components, and that all rely on data, and they all come from this one place and. We'll show you what that looks like, but like if you have a component, and now with CSS and JS, that component knows what it's meant to look like, but now it knows like what data it's meant to give as well. So like you put it on a page, if it's a feed list of I don't know friends on Facebook, uh, the um, it knows how to get that data from this GraphQL server. It just does it itself, which is like which was magic. I didn't have to do anything. Like I just had one file now with data and JavaScript and how it looked like it was amazing. So it was like you know really really happy with that. And, you know, once you get over the hurdle, you'll be happy, so don't worry. <laughs> so yeah, um, it allows you to not focus on endpoints. So, you know, before, um, you know, before like JSON API become a well-known thing, does anyone here use JS JSON API for that yet? So it's pretty cool. Um, and people were like just creating loads of like crazy endpoints and loads of stuff and then following the REST approach a little bit, but when it was like, you want to get nested resources, it was like, well, what do I do? Do I like, Add a query string to include like my friends as friends and friends as like friends names and avatars and it's like you could do that and JSON API allows you to do that but like if you're using the front end and like if you're using JavaScript to consume those JSON APIs like we it work like we have a, um, a cart if I go to get the cart I've then got to make additional calls to get like the cart image 
the product that's in the cart, or if I want to see what promotions are in there, I've got to make these additional requests to get that. But like with GraphQL, you can just make like one request to one endpoint, and you get exactly what you need. And it, when you're developing like interfaces on a daily basis, it's like it's super helpful and it allows you to just develop quicker, I guess. So it uh, just allows you to focus on all the fun stuff. So yeah, I'm really excited. So let's uh, let the hype continue. <coughs> At this point, has anyone got any questions about what I've said so far about the spec or anything? No? Cool. Let's dive on in. Um, so yeah, you're probably thinking like, well, that's, that sounds cool, but what does this actually mean? Like, what's the benefits of, of GraphQL? Um, one of the big things that I like is when you write these types that are self-documenting. So you get to define a type as if you're using TypeScript or Flow or any of the other languages that are typed, strongly typed, you can document what it is, if it's a string or it's an integer. That's all documented in graphical that comes with GraphQL. It has this built into that tool as well. So as you type, it gives you a description of what this field is and what it does and what data it returns. And it's like super helpful. So you know we'll go into that, but like self-document is one of the one of the biggest things that I like about that. And there's no more um, specific endpoints for data. So if I want to include like my friends as friends as friends, I don't have to have this crazy URL to do that. Um, I don't have to think like that anymore. Um, you know, it gets rid of those rest style endpoints, so you can just you know, use one <coughs> use one endpoint to rule them all. Uh, it's not always true though if you're using things like file uploads and uh, web sockets. So although subscriptions allow you to subscribe to here and see what's going on you'll need to um, do something else differently to, to handle that. Um, there is some support coming. There's a lot of people much smarter than me thinking about ways to do that and illustrating cool ways to do that, but <coughs> file uploading, a bit tricky with it. Um, you still have to use uh, another endpoint. A lot of people just kind of throw this on a subdomain, uh, files or upload or whatever to handle that. Um, and obviously WebSockets is going to go with that connection as well. So uh, still have to do that. It's not like a, a, a cure of all of that. <coughs> Yeah, so it's strongly typed and it has these Scala types of string and integer, which I mentioned. Um, so as you're writing code, it is all defined for you. You know when it is expecting a parameter of an ID, it's there. Same as any other type language when you call the function, all of that's there so you can see that it's a string or an integer and you know what data it's going to return. And if you're using tools like uh, Graphical or Apollo, um, the introspection part when you're writing the query, um, if you try and get like the person and their name, and then you try to get their friends. If you just pass friends, but friends is a relationship, it's just going to like bail on you and say you can't run that query. Um, in, in, in the interface, you can still make that query, um, so it's not like completely like a validation layer. Uh, it just when you develop with it, whatever ID you're using, if you um, if it is strongly typed and you do uh, you use an ID that supports that, then that's going to tell you when you're writing code, which just kind of <coughs> helps with that um, faster development, I guess. So real-time data with subscriptions is another thing for me, uh, which I find super easy to work with. I can have a subscribe function that listens for new posts on a blog, uh, new comments on a blog post, and if a person's on the page there and then, uh, you can just see the comments come in, and doing that before was like really difficult. Um, it wasn't difficult, but it was just, there was a lot of code involved, and it required a lot of libraries, and it become a bit of a mess to handle when people swap pages, you have two connections, and, yeah, it, and you have all these IDs floating around, it's just a bit tricky to deal with, and when you're doing this all the time, it's like, it comes comes something just like, meeting. Um, but with GraphQL subscriptions, you can just have one subscription on the page when it loads, and it's just listening for changes. And when those changes are emitted, the page can just update, which is super cool. And it's also incrementally adoptable. So, <clears throat> if you want to build out your API, one endpoint at a time, if you've got a user's endpoint, or if you're using a microservice <coughs> approach, You've got products, you've got an inventory system, uh, you've got promotions layers, all of this stuff in your API, you can just begin to plug parts of that out and say, okay, let's just focus on building queries for each of the endpoints to begin with, and you can just build a GraphQL endpoint that people can start to use over time. Um, and it can also be used not just with your clients, but um, in, in, in your infrastructure, so your microservices you can talk to each other with GraphQL and just query each other, and you can still deliver that via a REST endpoint um, I don't know why you do that, um, but you could offer both solutions. Um, so it's not just like this one thing that does one one thing, it can do many things and help many people at the same time on whatever layer that you're at. Um, so it's cool. Um, yeah, and one of the, one of the, one of the um, other things is you don't have to like, ask your engineering lead. You can take like, six months to 12 months to completely rewrite your API. Uh, just you know, increment this as you need it. And being a front-end developer, 
Uh, I myself all the time is telling our engineer team, like, look, this doesn't do this or this doesn't do this, or I've got to make multiple requests to get my friends' faces or whatever. If I just want to get that data, as a front-end developer, you can just build a GraphQL endpoint that does all of that logic in the background, and then you can just make the request to the GraphQL API and like let the GraphQL layer like deal with that. Um, I don't think as a front-end developer, as, as all of these uh, new frameworks come out and people are having to move from I don't know, it was like Angular 1, Angular 2, Angular 5, Angular 6, like, and then Ember, then React, like, there's all these different things and people jump around and they find different benefits for different tools and you've got Gatsby for building stack sites now and that uses GraphQL to get data. But awesome, if you're using like GraphQL, um, you can just switch around easily. All the data is in the same format, come in the same way. You haven't got to make all of these um, crazy functions that handle the JSON API. Uh, <coughs> GraphQL just makes it really nice to request your data and get it back. Um, also, um, controversially, it's easier to version, but it's also impossible, sort of, to, to version. You end up in the same mess as REST sometimes, where you'll put a GraphQL endpoint on a, um, V2, on a V2 or a slash V3 endpoint, and then you have the same problem as you had in REST. Or you can use, um, you know, uh, directives within GraphQL to sort of deprecate fields. So if someone's beginning to query a field, and you want to remove that, you want to change it, you can just Pass in some additional data that they'll get as feedback um, to help with that. And one of the good things um, with using tools like Apollo Engine, which is this awesome tool by the guys from Apollo, and I'll, I'll go into that later, uh, it allows you to see what fields are being called. So if someone is using your API and there's this weird little um, field and uh, value that someone's always wanting in their API, if people stop using that, uh, stop requesting that field, well, Apollo Engine tells you that, so over time you can see a graph of what endpoints are being called and what data is actually being consumed. So like, if no, if no one's using a particular thing, you can slowly decrement that and um, it, it, it's really helpful. <clears throat> but yeah, I think all of this sort of bundles up to um, faster development. With, um, with a lot of the client-side tools like Apollo Client, Facebook Relay, uh, it allows you to sort of build prototypes uh, a lot faster. You haven't got to look up documentation because it's inside of, uh, a lot of times inside of your editor, if that's type, you'll see, um, if it's sports typing, you'll be able to see all of that as you're typing queries. It'll come in there and it's, it's, it's really helpful as well. And um, if you're just using a graphical uh, interface, you can you know quickly create uh, this GraphQL layer on top of your existing endpoints or on top of the database, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and you just you can just prototype, get endpoints working, get mutations working, all of that. Um, so yeah, it's cool. So what does it look like? Um, well, before we have a look at what GraphQL looks like, let's look at what we've got currently. So we end up with something like this, where we've got like this slash two users, and you want their friends, and then you want to get orders, and you want to include order items. Um, then you want the third post, but you want the author's friends. Uh, you kind of got to make all these round trips to the server for this sometimes. Um, of course, you can use JSON API to include that, but when you want to kind of go across multiple resources, it becomes really, really difficult to maintain. Um, and this is why I really like GraphQL. So we have a look at the same kind of thing in GraphQL. We can see that we get the second user, we get the friends, and we can get their ID, the name, and then we get their friends' name. And this is just in one query. I'm just going to send this. Let the GraphQL layer take care of that. That'll work out the logic with joining what tables it has to go to. It's got to go to multiple databases. It kind of just does it like as magic to the front-end developer. They haven't got to worry about making all these round trips. That's kind of for the GraphQL layer to, to do. Um, and as a front-end developer, you might implement that GraphQL layer yourself, or you might let the engineering team do that. Um, but I strongly feel that uh, if you're using GraphQL, the people who um, are making requests to the GraphQL endpoint, those should be the same guys that are building it. So I think graph making GraphQL layers belongs solely with the front-end developer team just because they're using it. And a lot of times when engineering teams are building these fantastic APIs to do so much, when it actually comes to using it on the client side, and you're like, I've got to make 10 requests to get this, it's just like, that's insane. So um, yeah, it, I think it strongly lives in the front end developer world, um, but do what you want with it. <laughs> so in actual code, if we take a React component, um, hopefully you can see that. Um, we've kind of got this query at the top, which is like, get all faces. Then we can pass in a limit and an offset if we want to paginate. And then we pass those through, and again, we write the query directly in here that we want the name and what we want the photo. Then we've got this um, functional component below uh, that's a React component, and it's expecting two variables, limit and offset, 
passed to it from elsewhere. And then it, we have this thing called query, and that is um, from Apollo client. And you can pass into that the variables for the query. So like we need two variables above, we can pass that in. We don't have to pass them in because they don't have any um, bangs on the end, so they're not required. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really cool as well. And Apollo knows that they're not there. It's not gonna raise any errors because in the GraphQL side, that schema, it says they're not required in the parameters, so they're not required variables. You don't need it, it isn't gonna freak out. But when you do, when you don't pass something that's required, kind of tell you like, we need those. <coughs> so yeah, um, another thing with, with this is React render props. Um, anyone here using React, and React render props at all? Yeah, so React render props are really cool. Um, and there was this thing of the high order component, and the GraphQL query used to live on the higher order component. This is just a fancier way of uh, uh, sort of invoking that higher order component. Is you've got a, a you basically that query is a uh, is a React component itself, and then you just pass in the things that it needs to do. So we're passing the query. It knows uh, that it belongs in the uh, Apollo client world, so it knows how to query that database from an endpoint. It just deals with that, um, and then it passes through to React as as render props. So it's just like if you're using any component, you pass props. This is going to pass your data through as a prop, and it just makes it so easier, uh, so easy to deal with, which uh, uh, I really love. So let's have a look at a few things. We're going to have a look at mutations first. Um, we've looked at the query, what that looks like, and the, the name of friends uses and stuff. Um, and then this is kind of how you would mutate data. So in the same way as you make a post request to an endpoint or a put or whatever, um, GraphQL, you just make a post request and uh, you flag this mutation. You say, I want to create a product with name, a description, um, skew, slope, whatever. And then as you make that, you also say that you want the ID back and the name. Then it gives you it back in the exact same format that you requested it in. Um, so it's got the mutation's name there, then the data. Um, and this is super helpful. And this happen happens for every mutation. Uh, you can format how that comes back. But this is super helpful. Comes back as JSON, and away you go. <coughs> Subscriptions. Um, so yeah, again, I mentioned blog posts and their comments. You can create a subscription that listens to a new comment being created, updated, deleted, anything custom, someone likes it. Um, you can update the interface in real time. You haven't got to worry about it. This just deals with all of that, um, mm. which I really like as well. <coughs> and again, those are piped through and they're just, that stream's coming through with new comments or whatever it is. Uh, they've just kind of fed through to your interface uh, is uh, render props and you can just update the interface in like real time and the user doesn't know um, what's going on, and it just, just happens magically, um, which I really like. Got this thing called fragments as well. It's helpful um, if you're using the same sort of type, if we're using uh, a, a product, for example. Um, if we're always saying we want the product, we want we define what the product looks like. When we are making requests, we can pass in that fragment, and then we can say that this are all the properties, and we can just pass that in. And because uh, you may use tools on the front end. This helps a lot with caching, so it knows what that data looks like, and it'll cache the ID, and um, when you are using it, it'll come back, it'll always be used in the, same, in the same place. If you make any mutations to update things that are in the cache, the cache will update automatically as well with Apollo client. So you haven't got to do all of these updates and changes and functions, um, kind of just, it really helps. And we've got field aliases, which I find really helpful when you're working with third-party uh, GraphQL APIs. Uh, if you're I was consuming the GitHub GraphQL API, which is awesome, and there was a few things in there which I wanted back, but I wanted to pass to a UI library that I was using, and the UI library had some really smart things, like I could pass it an array of uh, items, and the items expected the object to look like uh, having a name and an image and an ID, but instead of changing that on the front end, whether you use filter or map in JavaScript to obscure how that looks or reduce, you can just say, well, actually I want a photo to be called image, um, and that just happens as well. Um, which is really cool. I know you can do this in other things, um, but with Graph GraphQL, you know, you define your query, define what you want the response to look like, and it'll come back just like that. So, <clears throat> who's using GraphQL in production? Um, I've had the opportunity to speak to um, some awesome companies, uh, a few guys from Lab Bible and Product Hunt, uh, I speak to sort of occasionally, and I'm always reaching out on Twitter to some of the other companies. GraphQL was started by Facebook in about 2015, and there's a few engineers there who are like, really hot on this, the really posting updates, providing examples. Um, so these are some awesome companies that you should go check out if you want to find out more about GraphQL, and you can, um, you know, you can see, see exactly what they're talking about. As I mentioned, GitHub, they have an um, API, 
uh, with GraphQL now, and this was only from a few days ago. Uh, you know, they're, they're rolling out more support for GraphQL across their stack, and I think um, they're one of their, the Mac app, I think, for Git, it's, if it's not already, it will be just using GraphQL, I think. Um, you know, I was reading about that, and I was like, well, wow, that's awesome. Like, this thing's only been around, like, what, like a couple of years publicly, and a lot of people, they've seen this hype, they're not sure what's going on, but a lot of the big companies are kind of using it, showing how this can benefit users, and then they're releasing those tools to the public, and, you know, the GitHub Mac app, I think, is open source, so you can see how that works, and various other companies have got open source libraries as well. Um, so I think there's a huge push right now, um, and, you know, that's what kind of, uh, I want to show you the next part of, of the talk is just to show you actually what this looks like with the REST API in, in GraphQL. So, take a break, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, hopefully the first half wasn't boring. Um, it's kind of exciting. Um, hopefully some of that passion kind of we laid across there. Um, I know it's kind of like, kind of modern hype kind of stack stuff. Um, even a lot of the stuff that we're doing now, I wasn't doing it two years ago. I was just, you know, a couple of years ago, I was using Angular, I was using jQuery. Um, before that, I was using Ruby on Rails. And again, before that, using PHP. And really love those, those stuff. I just wanted to challenge myself. Um, and some of this stuff's like really complicated. Some of the stuff's just really simple. Uh, I just want to kind of just challenge myself. So that's why I'm kind of on the, on this hype. Um, but it's, you know, a lot of people, you know, it's misrepresented somehow. Um, there's like good stigma, bad stigma with it. Um, people just go, ah, I don't want to hear about it. Um, cause I don't understand. Um, I didn't understand. And hopefully the first half kind of give you a glimpse into what's possible and how that helps, uh, for an end developer. Um, and primarily that's kind of who get, gains the biggest benefit apart from the user. Um, the backend team can still, you know, churn away building their awesome APIs and we can just kind of put this bit of sugar and layer on top uh, so we can kind of um, benefit from that. So I just want to talk about using GraphQL today and what that looks like. It's pretty green. It's not as green on my screen, but yeah. Uh, I'm not blind you. The typical stack uh, that I use now uh, is React with Apollo client and Apollo server with, uh, this is uh, GraphQL Yoga, and it's a it's like a minimalist framework for Apollo Server, and Apollo uh, are an awesome sort of startup. They create some amazing GraphQL stuff, um, and this is kind of what I rely on. So if I'm working on a client project or a side project or anything, I kind of just rely on these now because it's got some really good bindings uh, with React and Apollo. Those just work in harmony. Uh, it's really really helpful and really um, it's really good just to have a reliable framework that's used by many people and there's a massive community around it so I just want to talk about what that looks like today how you can get involved with it <clears throat> um, you know so a typical journey of, of beginning to use GraphQL uh, is just to learn um, how to define a schema and write a simple resolver and I'll show you what the code looks like for that when I do a demo next um, Apollo Launchpad is good um, this is this thing here Apollo Launchpad and it's like code pen, but you can write a GraphQL server on the left, you can run your queries on the right, and you can see documentation all within there as well. So you never have to leave your browser to make these, and it gives you an endpoint as well. So if you are using uh, one of the front end technologies that can link with GraphQL, this gives you a URL, so you haven't got to like host anything, do anything. This is all just there for you to use. So it's really awesome, really helpful. Um, and then also, um, you can level up prototyping with Prisma Cloud. So the guys from GraphQL built this stack called GraphQL uh, framework, which allows you to define a GraphQL server. And it was kind of took a serverless approach of deploying these little functions and resolvers. Then they come up with this thing called GraphQL Prisma, uh, which just m takes a lot of the boilerplate out of deploying servers. And it allows you to focus on just writing uh, your types, writing your schema and resolvers, but just pushing it to their cloud platform using their database. Um, you can also hook up your own database, but it's super awesome for prototyping. Um, and also for production, um, it's improving, the speeds are improving, um, but it, they've got such a huge community around it itself. If you're looking to get started with GraphQL, or you just want to know more about it, um, their forum is awesome. Definitely dive on in there, have a look. Um, and just, you know, I'll, I'll go there sometimes for support on how to write this query. I'm writing this query, but it doesn't work. Um, you know, the, the guys from Prisma are really hot. They're really current and, you know, they're very close knit with uh, the guys from Apollo. So they're really supportive as well. So that's Prisma Cloud there. Turn your database into a GraphQL API. Um, <clears throat> so some implementations on the server side. Uh, we're going to just go, briefly go over those, the client side, and also this concept of middleware as well. So the server side, um, normally what you'll do is define a schema. 
Uh, you'll write some resolvers. So a schema uh, might look like you'll say type as a person, the person has a name, that's required. Um, it'll always be there, it's not null. And you'll have a, an age, which is an int or whatever. Uh, you can define all of this schema and then you'll write a simple resolver on the other side that can go and get that data and return it back in the way the schema's looking uh, for it. So uh, that's kind of how those work. And once you start messing around with it, you see how they connect and you realize it's it's just like, I don't know, hitting a rest endpoint. Like you do all the same logic, um, which I'll show shortly. It's all just the same. Um, don't know what the big fuss is really. Um, yeah, connect your database, connect middleware, handle authentication. You'll kind of do that somewhat on the server side with the resolvers. So if someone is trying to mutate data, they're trying to change something in the database, create a post, update user's admin rights, <clears throat> you'll handle that authentication within the resolver. And normally you'll grab the context of the request and strip the headers and say, is this token valid? And you'll handle that how you normally do. All of that stuff happens like in the resolver in the same way as it would anywhere else in a controller uh, or a route. That'll, that'll, that'll happen there. Server-side libraries, um, huge support already for GraphQL. Um, I've used out of this list uh, the JavaScript one, um, which works with Node.js, awesome. Uh, I've used a little bit of the Scala one and the Ruby one, um, and there's like, you know, .NET, uh, which is cool as well, um, and any Lua and or Groovy, I've never even heard of that, but I've seen it when I was looking for supported libraries. Um, don't know what that is, but yeah, it's got some Groovy uh, stuff going on. Shit. That dad joke. Sorry. It's not even a joke. Um, yeah. So popular server side tools, like I mentioned, uh, Apollo Launchpad allows you, gives you that URL, so you can create a server in your browser, gives you a URL, and you can use it. Apollo Server is a package which you can install by npm or oh, yawn. Um, <coughs> cool kids. Yeah. Um, Apollo Engine, which is a hosted service that allows you to. Um, connect via is middleware. So it'll kind of look at your requests, <coughs> see how long these requests are taken, and it has a fancy dashboard. Uh, the, you know, I think they've got like one day or three days retention of logs, and then you have to pay for it. Um, but what you get from that is you get to see what fields are being accessed and used and, and being returned from the API, from requests. And then, you know, that helps massively. Uh, you know, if, if, uh, if uh, parts of an API are well used, and one of the things that uh, if you are building APIs, you build all these cool things and you try and measure them by, you know, hooking in segment and all these other tools that track what's going on. But if you use something like uh, Apollo Engine, it kind of just monitors all of the requests and the data coming through the pipe that you can see what's being used or not. And that can kind of, kind of help the product team understand where they should put more focus. Um, and also it helps identify issues if people um, are um, making more requests for the data. You can build up some new uh, query types and return that data straight away. Lastly, um, GraphQL Yoga is um, part, it's, it's, an, it's a Node.js server, it works with Apollo server, but it's got a lot of the convention taken care of. So if you use Ruby on Rails, that kind of got this configuration over con, uh, convention over configuration approach. GraphQL Yoga does that, sets up your uh, subscriptions. So you just kind of need to give it some uh, ports and stuff. Uh, and it kind of just works out the box. Um, and the same with uh, in, in GraphQL Yoga. You define where your schema lives, and where your resolvers live, and they just kind of talk in harmony, and you can provide context and headers and authentication all within that in that uh, stack as well. So it's really cool. Next um, is client side tools. We've got Apollo Boost, um, which uh, Apollo Boost is this again. It's a it's a it's some sugar. It's a it's a boilerplate for using Apollo client. The Apollo client was absolutely awesome before they made I think it was two dot one. 2.1, they split everything. So you had HTTP link and you had in memory cache and all this stuff got split into separate modules and people got really confused very quickly how it all connected. Um, they've seen that because the community is so vibrant and buzzing. Everyone thought, well, you know, then we've got to fix this. And they fixed it really quickly and they released Apollo Boost, which just kind of puts all that back together, but it's more composable. So you can use those in other projects and other parts of your application. Um, but let's check out Apollo Boost uh, to see what that does. Um, Apollo Client. Again, what I showed you with the query before, uh, you import a query and that's just a component. And then the Apollo client takes care of mi making a query to the GraphQL server. You hook up where the URL is for the GraphQL server and it just handles all that as well. And again, because you can use GraphQL over a plain uh, endpoint, you don't need any special tools to integrate it with. You can use some request libraries like uh, the GraphQL request and Urkel by Formidable Labs. Um, Ken Wheeler was working on that and kind of shown 
how you can just strip all of the fancy stuff out of the Apollo Boost and just have this sort of fetch library that just goes to a GraphQL layer and returns it back. So there's an example on there, I think, um, of Apollo Boost, just what it is. Um, just import it, and then you create a new client, give it a URL, that URL there is from uh, the Apollo Launchpad. So it kind of just all works, and that's kind of some initial config, but it's on GitHub, check it out. Um, it's really awesome. <clears throat> So some communities that you should be aware of if you want to get into this stuff and have a look, have a play around, uh, monitor what's going on. We've got uh, GraphQL, or the Prisma, as they're renamed. We've got their forum and Slack group. Uh, again, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. A lot of people discussing things. There's the GraphQL itself, the GraphQL Slack group, which a lot of people are asking questions and trying to come up with some crazy use cases and trying to see how that works with GraphQL. You know, th these are awesome communities that you can be part of. And just Twitter, I get so much on a daily basis just learning out you tricks and tips a lot of you know pop star and superstar developers that are way cleverer than me post all these little snippets i'll walk away and go that actually wasn't really difficult to understand and figure out it just took time uh, for someone else to explain it in an easier way and a lot of these communities do that they do take the time to teach and share with you the best ways of picking this stuff up and understanding it um in spectrum dot chat uh there's a graphql thread or community on there um that you can use um to chat with other people and Spectrum itself is built on Apollo and GraphQL, and it's open source. So if you wanted to know what a community, uh, what a project looks like that's using subscriptions and mutations and queries in Apollo and GraphQL, this is open source, it's on GitHub. Uh, it's really well structured, put together, and you can kind of just go through and see how it all fits together uh, just by looking at their source code. And I've learned so much just when they open sourced that a month ago or two, um, just how to think differently sometimes. Um, it's a really good resource. And then we've got like howtographql.com uh, is it shows you how you can get started with uh, Ruby, with Node.js, with Go, with in, in other languages. You can learn how to build a server. Then you can also learn how to build a client implementation as well. So if it's in uh, Vue, React, don't think they've got an Ember. Sorry, Johnny. Um, and then you got they got some other stuff on there, which is cool. Just teaching you about, about GraphQL, and that's from the guys at uh, GraphQL as well. Uh, so they've got a lot of resources. GraphQL.com uh, is by Apollo, and uh, Apollo have a lot of tools like for the GraphQL layer. They've got so much going on um, that they're really pushing forward. Uh, GraphQL.org is the Facebook um, website that teaches you about GraphQL, links to some of the community and the specification and tutorials and, and things and a blog of what's going on. Um, that's a really good resource as well. Um, they don't update it as much as what GraphQL do, but they kind of just sit back. They're testing it at Facebook like five years, like before they were testing GraphQL five years before they even told us about it, like what it did. Like, so <clears throat> they'll be working on stuff now that in a couple of years they'll come, they'll announce at a conference and say, we've been working on this, it solved this problem. And then there'll be a huge lot of hype around the next framework. Um, so yeah, like it's a really good resource and YouTube as well and Medium. Just search GraphQL on, on Medium and there's like loads of tutorials on there. Um, so like lastly, before I show you a demo, um, it is just a choice. Like you don't have to use GraphQL and I stumbled upon it because I was using React a lot and I was making a lot of requests to an API that I was having to make a lot of like round trips to the server uh, frequently and it was a bit, of a bit of a pain to do. And I seen this thing called Apollo and when I came back from GraphQL Europe last year, uh, I was like, how can we just connect this and work with this better uh, and sort of reduce those, that, that data overhead and, and all those round trips. And I kind of stumbled upon Apollo client, uh, we enjoyed it because I could just connect my React components with data and knew how it looked and what data it had. Um, that worked for me. And a lot of the cool things within Apollo client now is you don't even need things like Redux because you can create uh, local state management. It has local state management built in. So you can pass directives uh, to the client, the, the Apollo client and say, well, I just want to update this field and it's persistent for that uh, for, for that user. It doesn't store it anywhere. It's the same way as Redux would. So if you switch pages and someone's liked something, uh, you don't have to fetch for that data to come back. When you go back, you know it's there. Uh, it just allows you to work in the same way as you would with Redux with Apollo Client. So you haven't got to install another dependency and figure out Redux. Um, you know, this, this you know, again, handles all of that, which is, which is really nice. Um, so I'm going to attempt to show you a demo. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, which project are we in? So in the REST API, um, kind of some crazy React stuff that I just quickly smashed together to show you a quick example. <clears throat> but what we got on the right-hand side is a typical um, 
endpoint for calling out to another API, it returns some stuff. So let's fire this up and show you. Fingers crossed. It's not GraphQL taking ages, by the way. So yeah, this is just calling out to a REST endpoint um, on my machine, uh, which is here. And I can pass in various query strings that limit the amount of stuff that I get back. Uh, this is just going to this here and um, returning the data that I want, passing in the, the query strings and my API key. Pretty simple stuff. And then React is just calling out for that data. It's returning it, um, showing a loading spinner, and then just smashing together a, a list of, of, of people from this faces API. So this is kind of what we're used to. Um, and it works, like this is awesome, like it works, does the job. I'm gonna to attempt to switch over now and show you what the same thing looks like in GraphQL. Cool. So this is graphical. Um, can I change this color? That's a bit crazy. Don't know what's going on there. Um, so yeah, this is like graphical in a way. Um, it's GraphQL's playground. And this is like what I'm talking about, like faces. I want the name and I want the photo. Uh, well, I can just go and do that. And that's calling out to my GraphQL endpoint. I'll show that looks like in a sec. But <clears throat> I'm able just to just type here and, and, and get what I want. I'm also able to just pass in like, well, I only want two, and it'll go and do that and, and bring it back. Pretty pretty cool, and then we'll offset that by one. And again, it's going to win doing that. And then gender, I can pass in an enum here of male, and then the back end takes care of that, and again, passes that on. Like, this is just, this is cool. So then we get this schema here, and you can see we've got these query types. We can see that's going to return an array of faces, and this is what a face looks like. It's got a string and these are non-null. It'll return a photo. And if you've got a description, you can put in here. Uh, it tells you what kind of scholar type it is. So it's it's really awesome. Like this thing's really helpful when you're just like trying to understand how an API works. Um, when you're trying to understand what your data looks like when it's coming from an API. This stuff's just here. You haven't got to go leave your browser. Um, you can kind of prototype in here very, very quickly and kind of create the queries that would sometimes before take forever. <clears throat> so this is awesome. Uh, if I switch over to this here, uh, we can change the page, uh, how many per page here. And um, we can say we want the second page and get 50 per page, 10. You'll see like this request here and then a request again. It's not loading a spinner anymore because all that's in the Apollo client cache. It's all taken care of in memory. You can hook up other cache libraries as well. But like this is all taken care of and same layout. It does the same thing as what the rest one did. Um, again, it's just that choice. So let's have a look at some of the code for that as well. Yeah, cool, so I spit this one out a little bit more, but we got the feed here, and um, we've got this query that's calling out the faces, and these are the uh, variables that we had, and then we've got this query component here. We're passing in the query, and then we're passing in the variables as well, and then we're creating the same list of faces as well. There's literally like not a, a huge amount of difference here. And then if we head over to the GraphQL side, <clears throat> We have a look at the schema. I'm defining that we have a query type of faces and these are uh, the variables. None of them are required and it will return an array of faces. This is what my face looks like. And then this is uh, the gender enum as well. Then in the resolver, pretty much exactly the same as what we had before in, uh, in here for the rest endpoint. But now this is again, just resolving through a GraphQL resolver. Um, not much difference there. Hopefully this makes sense, um, but it kind of, it does the same thing. It works the same way. It takes in arguments the same way as before, took in those query um, strings and put them, mashed them together. This is doing the same thing um, and making a request to the API. And then it's waiting for a response. Then it's just returning that array back to GraphQL, the GraphQL layer, and those are just transformed to that type. Then they return to the browser. Um, pretty simple. None of this uh, is any magic or important a few libraries. 
uh, from Apollo React Apollo. Um, then we've got a filter, which is kind of just smashed together. Just plain stuff, like if you've been using React, plain stuff, but like <clears throat> which we can connect uh, a URI here to one endpoint, but because I was inside of, of here, this knows what the endpoint is here. You could change this to be GitHub's API, and you could go and make a request, and immediately you can see when you type what I can get back. Like this, this is magic. Like I can just see what I can get. Um, yeah, that's just because I'm requesting, making the same request twice. Um, maybe I do this. If I remember? Yeah, you can do that. So I want to get the same data. Um, scroll down. Just got names this time, but I've added a field alias for people um, instead of faces. Like. It's really helpful, and when you deal with this on a daily basis, calling out to APIs, doing stuff like this is uh, really, really helpful.